Hello, everyone. My name is Simon. I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds, and I'm going to present my independent epistemic agent account of group justification. So here we go. Um, since this is a presentation for the International Society of Social Anthropology, I won't pump much intuitions here or give a lot of background about groups actually believing things or give much motivations for why it is important to think about justified group beliefs. I will just start with the observation that we commonly encounter ascriptions of group beliefs in our everyday life. We say, for example, that an administration believes that the frontline workers are doing a good job or that a company believes that they easily uh, will capture the market share. And all kinds of social ontologists and social epistemologists alike uh, think that we ought to take these uh, descriptions seriously. And I will take them seriously as well. So as in the individual case, once we are at this point, uh, we could ask if the beliefs ascribed to the group are justified or unjustified. So this is not only important for epistemic reasons, but also as practical and ethical implications regarding, for example, the responsibility of groups. So despite the importance of these questions, discussions of group justification have only very recently received focused attention in the literature. Um, and here we can identify uh, two common but diametrically opposed approaches, as in other endeavors in social uh, ontology. There are on the one hand summativist and on the other hand non-summativist uh, accounts of justified group belief. So the non-summative inflationary accounts say that a group G justifiedly believing that P cannot be understood only in terms of some or uh, of all groups members justifiedly believing that P. Uh, one example of such an account is found in Schmidt. Uh, he puts forward a joint acceptance account of group justification. And on the other hand, we have summative deflationary accounts stating that a group uh, justified the believing that P is understood only and exclusively in terms of some or all of the group's members justifiedly believing that P. Uh, one example of such an account is found in Elvin Goldman. So, Lackey and others have shown that both types of accounts face serious problems. And based on that, they have developed some kind of hybrid accounts being not clearly deflationary or inflationary. Uh, I won't discuss any of them here, but I will build on some desiderata identified by Lucky and others. So recent discussions of group justification have revealed that we need to embrace a view of group justification that is sensitive to the evidence actually possessed by the group and the evidence the group should have possessed. And also accounts for instances in which the evidence is distributed among the members or subgroups of the group. And the evidence could be defeated by some evidence possessed by some member or some subgroup. Uh, it is important to mention that the second claim here that the evidence the group should possess is somewhat con controversial as it is controversial uh, in individual epistemology. Nonetheless, I will think that my account could account for uh, such cases of normative obligations. So in addition to these desiderata, my account also builds on a fundamental assumption of uh, epistemic continuity. We can formulate the principle of epistemic continuity as follows. Any theory of justification shall apply to both individual and collective beliefs alike. This maximizes simplicity and the explanatory scope of my account. So uh, this principle is found, for example, in uh, Andrew Peet's account of uh, group normal uh, reliabilism, which he has presented at the last conference here, uh, which states that we shall seek for continuity in our epistemic theorizing. Uh, our understanding of justification should be universal and independent of the epistemic entity in question. Doing otherwise would call into question the possibility of general theorizing about justification and also involves the risk of changing the subject when we turn from individual to collective epistemology. So any theory of justification that is viable for both individuals and group is prima facie uh, preferable to any alternative account that is only concerned with individual, individual or collective justification. So most prominently, this principle has attacked by Gilbert and Pilchman, so it is not universally accepted, uh, just to point that out. So, Furthermore, my account does not make any commitment to any specific understanding of group belief. So there might be different ways for groups to believe things, uh, summative, non-summative, 
uh, yeah, so I want to remain pluralist. And this could also uh, be applied to individual beliefs. So we just presuppose that the epistemic subject believes something and then we analyze the epistemic state of the belief. So, but what are even the potential epistemic subjects we are thinking about? Which kind of social entities uh, could be regarded as epistemic subject? Of course, individuals, then also small scale uh, committee like groups and even huge scientific collaborations. Um, maybe uh, I don't want to commit myself to that, but maybe even whole epistemic communities. So here's an evidentialist account of group justification being epistemically continuous and also uh, fulfilling the desiderata identified by Lucky and others. So I will just read it out to you. My independent epistemic agent account. An epistemic subject S justifiably believes that P if there is a set of evidence R1 with an R called the evidential base of S um, and R1 is sufficient to support P. Uh, furthermore, the belief that P uh, is properly based on R1. In addition to that, we also need some kind of no defeater clause, um, but I will come back to that later. Given that account as it stands, we need to identify uh, several moving parts. On the one hand, we need to have an understanding of evidentialism and evidence, as well as the evidential base. On the other hand, we need to uh, think about what it means to be sufficient to support uh, and what properly based means, uh, as well as spell out some no defeater clause. So starting with evidentialism. Um, evidentialism is defined as the view that epistemic justification of a belief is determined by the quality of the believer's evidence for belief. Uh, this view is found, for example, in Connie Feldman uh, in individual epistemology. So for the evidentialist, when we talk about justification, we need to talk about evidence. And if we talk about evidence as that which has the power to justify belief, we need to talk about justification. So there isn't one without the other. This leads to uh, a supervenience thesis, uh, which states that normative facts about the doxastic attitudes of the epistemic subject directly supervene on facts uh, about the evidence. So any two uh, epistemic agents possessing exactly the same evidence would be exactly alike with respect to what they are justified in believing uh, about any given issue. So um, here's a guiding example of a prime example of a group uh, having a justified belief, which are used to spell out my understanding of evidence and the evidential base and so on. So several days before launching a crewed spacecraft for a mission to the moon, the executive committee, the operative members of NASA, sets up a teleconference with several teams of experts sharing their expertise and deliberating the evidence. So there is, for, for example, a group of engineers presenting how the spacecraft is attached to the launch vehicle, how the heat shield protects the crew at atmospheric entry and so on, and a group of chemists selling how the fuel is burned and so on. So each group of experts, as well as the, every individual expert, has a good amount of evidence that the subtasks uh, of the space mission will be successful. At the conference, this evidence is shared among the executive committee, and based on that, Every member, as well as NASA, as a group, forms the belief that P, it is safe to launch the mission as planned. So, but what should be regarded as the evidence possessed by NASA? The physical and theoretical pieces of evidence presented by the experts, or the beliefs of the experts, or maybe just the beliefs of the executive committee members, the operative members. So, my account is very internalistic um, by relying on a phenomenological understanding of evidence. I would regard all of the uh, relevant mental states playing the appropriate epistemic roles as the evidence. Uh, so the beliefs, experience or perceptual states of all of the members and the subgroups. So every mental state that could be referred to in principle when giving a reason for why we think a belief is justified. So just to clear something up in practice, of course, we often do refer to artifacts, for example, when providing justification for the belief that uh, Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great, I might refer to the uh, manuscripts of Plutarch saying that he was the teacher of Alexander the Great. But this phenomenological internalist understanding of evidence uh, suggests that what we really refer to is not the manuscript, but our belief that it is written in uh, Plutarch that Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. So we can apply the same understanding to evidence also to NASA. 
So um, two potential restrictions often pointed out at this point by uh, evidentialists. There might be only, uh, we might only regard psychologically accessible uh, mental states and epistemically acceptable evidence uh, as being part of the evidential base. So Feldman uh, differentiates be between total possible evidence, which is just all of the evidence, and the total actual evidence, which is only the accessible and proper evidence. However, in my account of group justification, I will think of R as being very broad. So R is the evidential base R, which is the total evidence possessed by an epistemic subject S, which is exactly the sum of the relevant mental states possessed by all members and subgroups of S. So there is no accessibility or properness demand. However, when it comes to R1, which is a subset of R and the subset that is sufficient to support P, we have an accessibility and a properness demand. On top of that, R1 also needs to be consistent, so it cannot include evidence both including P and non-P. So what does proper mean? Um, properness is a relation between a particular belief uh, and a particular piece of evidence. So it needs to be adequate uh, so that it would propositionally justify, so to speak, P. And it also needs to be exclusive. So R1 is not sufficient to support P if there is some proper evidence for P within R, while R1 also contains improper evidence for P. Uh, to illustrate this, consider the following example inspired by Turi. Uh, the members of a scientific collaboration G uh, possess evidence R1 that is taken together sufficient for supporting the belief P, while all members of the scientific collaboration see that the combined evidence R1 makes it overwhelmingly likely that P, they still fail to accept it. So one day a tarot card reader visits the collaboration and tells the scientists that based on one of her recent tarot card readings, she is determined that accepting R1 makes it overwhelmingly likely that P. So based on that improper reasoning and uh, the group finally accepts that R1 makes it overwhelmingly likely that P. And hence the group forms the belief P. So the intuition this example is designed to fuel uh, is of course that the belief that P while still being supported by the overall evidence is unjustified, as it is reached by also relying on obviously absurd assumptions. Um, so the group would have been able uh, to infer P from the evidence R1, but did not. However, by adding an improper piece of evidence, uh, the tarot card reading, um, they formed the belief that P. So, okay, now we have defined what sufficient to support means. Um, I've already pointed out that there's the underlying distinction uh, of propositional and doxastic justification in the background. So pro propositional justification only requires the epistemic subject to possess a sufficient evidential base, whereby doxastic justification, on the other hand, additionally requires the belief to be based on the relevant evidential base. So we need some kind of uh, epistemic basing demand, which is for, uh, a, common uh, orthodox knowledge in epistemology and found in many different accounts of individual justification. One way to spell it out is like this. So if P is propositionally justified for S in virtue of S having evidence R1, and S believes P on the basis of R1, that S believes that P is doxastically justified. But what does, me, uh, does it mean to believe something on the basis of? So we need some underlying theory of epistemic basing. And the most prominent theory of epistemic basing is causal. And I will just go with the causal relationship of epistemic basing, uh, partly because it is also found at least implicitly in Connie and Feldman, the most uh, famous theory uh, of individual evidentialism. So in, for my account, uh, an epistemic subject to be doxastically justified to believe P, the belief must be based on which is to say non dividendly caused by a set of evidence R1, which is sufficient to support P. So one way to think about the epistemic basin relationship is here uh, that is a causal relation between mental states, because evidence are relevant mental states and beliefs are mental states as well. So uh, just to point out in principle, my account I think is compatible with a more nuanced causal doxastic theory uh, of epistemic basing. But yeah, I, I will not spell that out in detail here. 
So furthermore, we also need some understanding of proper phasing. Just being cost alone uh, is not enough. Uh, there's also uh, one example by Thierry, uh, often discussed in the literature, which I won't discuss here in, in detail. Just to point out, my account is also flexible to deal with uh, proper phasing. So on the one hand, the base itself can be infected. There can be some improper base of evidence within R1. And on the other hand, something can go wrong with the inference itself that makes our potentially proper based belief improper. So we need some proper basing requirement. If the evidence R1 is sufficient to support P and if S properly bases her belief on P uh, on R1, then S has toxastic justification for P. So my account is sensible to exclude improperness from both from the functional part of the base R1 as well as the basing relation between R1 and P. So I think an intuitive understanding of proper basing is enough. Uh, Modus ponens is proper, uh, other ill-formed inferences like affirming the disjunct is not. So, yeah. Here a short recap of my account, uh, the independent epistemic agent account of group justification, an epistemic subject as justifiably believes that P if, first there's a set of evidence R1 within R, and R1 is sufficient to support P, uh, and the belief P is properly based on R1. So now we need to clarify uh, three, the no defeated clause. So even if the evidence R1 is sufficient to support P, when considered in isolation, there might be some additional evidence within R such that one is not justified in believing P, given both pieces of evidence. Such evidence is often called a defeater. So having a distributed and vast nature of R in the case of groups in mind makes having a mechanism for detecting defeaters even more urgent than in the individual case. So Take the following example, uh, limited information. The PI, uh, the principal investigator of a scientific research collaboration, G, forms the belief that P on behalf of the group G. The belief that P is properly based on the body of evidence R1, sufficient to support P. She has deep insight into the epistemic structure of the group and a sophisticated understanding of a significant part of the evidential base R. However, she isn't aware that there is a de defeater phi within R when added to R1, such that R1 and phi together are not sufficient to support P. So this would lead to a no defeater cause looking like this. Within R, there's no undefeated defeater phi when added to R1, such that R1 and phi together are not sufficient to support P. So the problem with uh, this no defeater cause is that it seems very demanding. It makes the factual claim that there is no undefeated defeater phi within R. This is equivalent, basically, to say that R is sufficient to support P. So why do we refer to R1 then uh, anyway? So, and also, given uh, this no defeater clause, there's no way for the group to ensure uh, justification in their beliefs. They could never uh, have a meta belief uh, reflective uh, upon, upon the belief, uh, ensuring them that they are justified. So another way to think about uh, the limited information case is that the group or the PI is justified by virtue of having evidence that R is sufficient to support P and not by the fact that R is sufficient to support P. So that there, there's not only evidence for P but evidence that R itself is sufficient to support P, which should itself be regarded as evidence called R2. So an alternative way to spell out the no defeater clause looks like this. Within R there's a set of evidence R2 and R2 is sufficient to support Q. R is sufficient to support P. So this would be maybe the PI tr trust her co-investigators informing her if there would be a potential defeater within R in a way that ensures her to form the belief P based uh, on behalf of the group. So, um, so we understand R2 as some kind of second order evidence, evidence about the character of the evidence itself or the rational capacity of the epistemic subject to respond to evidence. Uh, one such example of second order evidence would be expert knowledge. So consider an expert studying some phenomena and acquiring a set of first order evidence E, taking it to support a conclusion C. So given that she is generally competent, uh, the fact that she arrived at C based on E is often considered a second order evidence E uh, star, that E supports C. So E star not only supports E supports C, but also C itself. So note that uh, this no defeater clause does not demand that the epistemic subject forms an actual belief about the relationship of P and R. 
uh, Free is a factual statement of, about there being some second order evidence, such as uh, Free Prime is a factual statement about there being no defeaters within R. So uh, here again, my account, uh, including the just spelled out no defeater clause. So just to wrap things up, there are two types of problems uh, often discussed in the literature on group justification, uh, problems with the evidential base, uh, distributed, defeated, and improper evidence, including the evidence, uh, evidential base, and evidence that should have been possessed by G but is not possessed by G. Uh, such problems are often discussed under the label of normative obligations. And also, on the other hand, there are problems with epistemic basing, uh, problems of improper inference and ill-formed uh, beliefs. So, in addition to the cases already conversed, uh, in fact, the base ill-formed inference, uh, limited information, uh, one and two, I only discussed one here. Uh, I could discuss three additional types of problems, uh, problems regarding distributed and different evidence, uh, normative obligation problems, or evidence manipulation problems, but I just, saw that I ran out of time, but I'm happy to discuss these problems with you in the Q&A session. Um, but I have laid out the essential bits and the core of my account, so uh, I'm looking forward to your comments and feedback. Thank you very much.